Stockholm, Wachtung, Noau. Hi, my name is James Griffiths. Welcome back to the channel and today we're going to look at a absolute classic immortal album, Mike Oldfield, Tubular Bells, released on the 25th of May 1973. So this video uh, has been partly inspired by watching a great video from Jeff at Calico Silver, which I think he uploaded about a year ago now and for some reason I'd missed it but I caught up with it and it was a long video and it was a history of Jeff's long-time musical love affair with Mike Oldfield, wonderful video made me remember that I hadn't listened to, to this album for a long time. I was going on a long car journey, so I queued it up in the car and uh, it was a great nostalgia fest for me. I was too young to hear it when it first came out. It was released on the 25th of May 1973. I probably heard it in around, I don't know, maybe 1981, 1982. The record came into our house courtesy of a friend and work colleague of my father's and um, I'm fairly certain it's the same friend who several years before had lent my dad a copy of Band on the Run. I'm fairly certain it was him so if it's true then this guy who I've not seen for many years uh, I owe him a huge immense debt because these two records are among my favourite albums of all time. He lent my dad this album because uh, my dad uh, was not really big into pop music, popular music, he was a huge uh, classical music buff and I think this friend knew that this album was a classic crossover album really between what you might call pop music and classical music and um, my dad was also a big hi-fi buff, he, you know, he always had a great setup in the living room so we sat down together, I can still remember the first time we sat down together he and I, and we sat and listened to Tubular Bells for the first time, and it just sounded immense. It was amazing. We were both totally knocked out by it. We'd never heard anything like it before. And I think that probably replicated the experience of a whole generation of music listeners who'd grown up with the album, who heard it when uh, it first came out. The album, for a long time, lived in our house downstairs in my father's uh, music room. It didn't come upstairs with me for another three or four years, I think, until he was sure that I was old enough to look after it. And then when I I was about 14 or 15 I used to play this in my room and Jeff was describing an experience in his video of lying on the floor with his head jammed between his two speakers you know just listening in absolute rapture to tubular bells and I had a very similar experience listening to it over and over again and this album it kind of it seemed to carve pathways neural pathways through my brain and every time I listened to it, it was it was like being on a quest or a journey. Side one is very much structured like a quest, I think. It kind of it builds up to this amazing crescendo. And when the tubular bells finally come in, it is um, it's almost like a kind of Shostakovich moment where this huge vista opens up and this this thing that you've been searching for all the way through the first side just hones into view. And it's just this just this amazing climax. Of course, you've got the great Vivian Stanchel. Uh, introductions where he introduces each instrument in turn and it starts to build up and you know all these just these overdubs this crazy overdubbing that Mike Oldfield sort of pioneered really it had been done before him but this was the first time that an album I think of this success and this stature had been composed in that way and um like I said, it was an album that was just hugely important to my musical development and um, I can't think of another album in my collection really which I listen to quite so much and quite so often over a, um, you know, a certain period of time. So I thought it would be good fun just to quickly get into this. Now, I've recently watched a documentary, a brilliant documentary about Mike Oldfield, which is on YouTube, you can watch it. It's a documentary about the history of Tubular Bells. Very, very interesting guy. He was born, um, I think he grew up in Reading uh, in the 1950s and um, he'd had some problems at home in his early life. His mother had poor health and there were certain problems happening um, in his family life. He had a sister called Sally and a brother as well, but Mike grew up uh, with some emotional problems, I think, and some mental problems. It was a loving family, I think, but there was some there were some issues going on. And uh, he became a precocious musician early on. He um, he learned to play the guitar. His sister, Sally, who wanted to be a pop star, in fact, she was a pop star briefly, a folk pop star, she taught him to play a couple of chords, and then within two weeks, he'd vastly outstripped her and was playing all this amazing, you know, classical-style guitar. 
and he locked himself away in his bedroom when his mother, I think what happened was his mother had a miscarriage and she had to go into convalescence for a long time. And when she came home from that, she was in a quite a distressed emotional state. So Mike Oldfield just locked himself away in his bedroom and for a couple of years just basically taught himself to play music, become a virtuoso on the guitar. And um, by the time he was 17, he joined his first band. He was the bass player for Kevin Ayer's Whole World. So he plays on the album Shooting at the Moon. My research told me that he plays bass on that album, but I've heard that album. I've got that record in my collection. And to, and to my ears, it sounds like he plays guitar on that as well. It had a very distinctive guitar sound. Mike Oldfield was very influenced by Celtic music and Celtic sounds, and he had this unique way of making his guitar sound like pipes. Um, never quite worked out how it was he did that, whether it was just in his fingers or whether it was to do with his amplification, but he was uh, he was capable of making his guitar sing like a, some kind of Celtic pipe, and it's a very distinctive sound, a very high keening sound, which he was to use on many more albums after Tubular Bells. So he played bass for Kevin Ayres, and then that band broke up in about 1971, and Kevin Ayres lent Mike um, a tape recorder. It was a Bang & Olufsen Biochord quarter-inch tape recorder. And Mike basically locked himself away in his flat in uh, Pimlico, I think it was, in London, and started to overdub parts. And essentially, the birth of Tubular Bells just happened there, really. It seems to me like it was mainly improvised. He started playing this um, figure on the piano, which has an uneven time signature. I think it's one bar of seven and one bar of eight or something like that. And it has a kind of a cyclical pattern to it. But because it's not equally weighted in terms of bar lengths, it doesn't become boring. It becomes compulsive to listen to. And um, so he made these demos. Now, originally, I didn't realise this, the demos that he made for this album uh, were not one continuous piece. He actually made several different pieces, all of which finished, you know, faded out or came to an end. And the producer of the record, or one of the producers, I think it was Tom Newman, um, he later said that he wished that the album had come out like that. He said he was, he was quite put out when Mike decided to... Uh, tie all these musical ideas together he said the album would have been a lot better had it been done in these discrete parts not sure if i agree with that i can't really imagine how it would have been better but i guess he heard it so he must know so um mike recorded these demos and he'd been inspired apparently by a couple of pieces a band called centipede who i don't know much about i must confess had done uh, a long piece called september energy which I've, which I've never heard, uh, but that was a key influence on Mike. And also he was really influenced by the composer Terry Riley, who'd done this piece called Rainbow in Curved Air. So there were precedents for this record. It didn't just come out of nowhere. He definitely had artistic or musical touchstones that he was referring to in his mind. But I think there was a sense with this record that he'd had a, quite a lot of emotional and psychological pain growing up and these musical ideas had been welling up inside him and they were just sort of spilling out into this tape recorder. Um, late in 71, he joined uh, the band of um, a reggae blues artist called Arthur Louis and uh, they were doing some demos at the Manor Studios in Oxfordshire which was a converted squash course. It had been built or it had been, it had been converted um, by the fledgling company Virgin, um, Richard Branson and his business partner Simon Draper had started this mail order record company and um, they decided to branch out into musical production so they hired these two guys Tom Newman and Simon Hayworth as their musical producers and these two guys were kitting out this uh, converted squash course in Oxfordshire, it was called The Manor, it was this uh, you know lovely country house. These two guys Tom Newman and Simon Hayworth they ended up hearing Mike's um, demo, I think Mike, uh, Mike thrust it at them because he was down at the studio anyway um, doing some session work and um, Tom Newman and Simon Hayworth both loved it they took it back to Richard Branson and who listened to it on his houseboat apparently and um, quite soon afterwards they decided to take a punt and give Mike some downtime at the studio and essentially over the maybe a number of months um, in between doing sessions for other artists, Mike pieced together this record, 274 overdubs and um, just this extraordinary piece of music started to develop. When he first went into the studio, he asked Richard Branson, he, he drew a list of all the instruments he wanted and just an incredible list of instruments, just 
you know, Farfisa organ, glockenspiel, uh, assorted percussion, Lowry organ, concert timpani, Hammond organ. Um, but the tubular bells was an accident. John Cale had been in the studio before doing, not sure which album that would have been, but Mike was going in one day and they were bringing out all John Cale's instruments because John Cale had finished in the studio and Mike saw a set of tubular bells being brought out to be loaded into the van and really without any thought he just kind of stopped the guys and went oh could you put those back not really even knowing what he was going to do with them uh, <laughs> but of course they ended up being the climax to side one and um, when they were trying to record the tubular bells melody they were using the, the little hammer that had been provided with the instrument and they couldn't get they couldn't get the sound or the volume out of the tubular bells and mike was getting really frustrated the two producers were getting really irate as well so finally one of them uh, went out and bought a claw hammer a proper hammer and mike ended up using that to hit the tubular bells and he hit them so hard he actually broke them the cover of the album, uh, it's meant to be a kind of broken tubular bell. This cover was done by a guy called Trevor Key, and um, I think it was meant to be a kind of ironic comment, really, of the fact that Mike had, uh, had smashed these these bells to a pulp in trying to get just this really kind of loud sound at the end of side one. Um, the way that Vivian Stanchel came to be involved, he was, I think he was a regular guest at the manor. He'd been in the Bonzos, of course, and uh, Mike was too shy to approach him at first. He wanted to get him to um, introduce the instruments in turn, which was done, I think that had been done on the album Gorilla by the Bonzos, but he was too shy to approach him, and um, I think it was Tom Newman basically said, you know, go on, ask him, go on. So he went to ask him, and... Um, and he agreed to do it, but apparently he was an absolute—he was, was an absolute nightmare to cue. He just couldn't—he couldn't read out the instruments in time, so he was reading them in time to you know the music, and it, 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 they really had a, a a really difficult time trying to get him to do it in time. But it worked in the end, of course, and it did provide this wonderful, um, very English eccentric, quirky kind of climax to side one. Side one of the album was completed. I think they shopped it around at that point, and then Mike went back into the studio to compose side two which i think is even better than side one in a way i think side two has got a more um it's got a more elegiac quality it's more cerebral you know the first the first maybe five or six minutes just beautiful interlinking acoustic guitar parts and it builds up into this wonderful choral piece which i think on the remake that he made in the 90s or maybe one of the other remakes i think that piece is called peace just this wonderful choral just wonderful floaty vocals and then it goes into this bagpipe uh, guitar section where it plays this um, it sounds like pipers walking through the mist you can hear the kind of you know the Scottish drum going and just these kind of droning guitars that sound like bagpipes that was always a favorite segments of mine that goes out into the caveman section where you hear Mike doing all these strange <laughs> gruff vocals all this sounds a bit like Klingon um, and the story behind that was when when he'd done the first side and then there were no vocals on it, um, Richard Branson had been quite concerned. I think he got some feedback from the industry and people had said, "Look, we need to have we need to have some vocals on this, or we're never going to be able to sell it." And he'd gone back and he'd told that to Mike, and Mike was absolutely furious and uh, got really drunk and went into the studio and ended up recording this crazy caveman section, which was done apparently high pitched. It was him screaming, and then they slowed the tape down in order to get that uh, that gruff kind of sound. Fantastic. It's the only section of the album that contains drums. It was the drummer from the Edgar Broughton band. I forget his name, sorry. But that's the kind of big rock section. There's a couple of rock sections on side one as well with all these fuzzy guitars, you know. One, inter one interesting thing I learned was that even though uh, there's all these different guitars credited on the album, you know, fuzz guitar and speed guitar and all this kind of stuff, it was just one guitar that Mike used. And the guitar belonged to Mark Bolan. And he plugged it into an effects unit, and that what you know that's what that's what got him all the different guitar sounds. And uh, I quite like the way that on the album the music it's kind of it juxtaposes all this very cerebral, spiritual kind of music with stuff that you might hear some teenagers making in their bedroom. You know, really sort of gritty, gutsy guitar playing, not not played all that well, really. You know, almost deliberately bad. Um, 
but that of course that juxtaposed fantastically with all the passages where you could clearly hear that Mike was an amazing virtuoso classical guitarist I mean that you, you, you know you really hear that at the end of side one side one climaxes after the Chibi the Bells um, thing with just this wonderful picking guitar Mike always had uh, big long fingernails he was a folk style guitarist and um, just an amazing combination of stuff folk music classical music choral music Steve Broughton apparently was the drummer and the Manor Choir uh, con um, consisted of Mundy Ellis and it says Girly Chorus here. I'd forgotten about that Girly Chorus and uh, Mike's sister Sally. So um, the record was released, came out. It was the first album to be released on Virgin, and um, it wasn't a, uh, it wasn't an instant hit. It took about a year to get to number one just climbing up the charts and um, Mike gradually realised that he had this monster hit on his hands. Then of course it was used, parts of it were used in The Exorcist in America and that just made Mike a huge star in America, which he didn't really pursue. He, he, and, you know, he was a bit like Jerry Rafferty after Baker Street, you know, just not, not, not interested in fame at all. Um, he'd had some problems while doing Chibi the Bells, emotional problems, um, apparently he just used to wander around crying in between sessions, you know, he was he was in a real mess. And uh, the pressure that came with the release of Tubular Bells, particularly when he had to record it, um, when he had to perform it live, that was made clear to him, I think, by the Virgin team, that they wanted a live performance. And he ended up doing a live performance uh, in, in a classical concert hall. I think it was maybe the Queen Elizabeth Hall. Could be wrong about that. But he got a band together and he was so he was so scared, he absolutely dreaded doing it, that he tried to turn back as he was being driven to the concert. He was being driven to the concert by Richard Branson in this fabulous old Bentley uh, that Branson owned. And they were nearly at the venue and all of a sudden he just turned to Richard and said, Richard, I can't do it. I just cannot do this concert. And Branson had to bribe him with the car. He said, look, if you do the concert, you can have the car, essentially. Uh, and that's what persuaded him to get on stage. He didn't enjoy the concert, he thought it was performed, uh, it was a subpar performance, but it brought the house down, he got a standing ovation, and it, I think it really flummoxed him, uh, because I don't think he thought it had been a good performance at all. It'd be nice to report that in the year straight after, he enjoyed his fame and success, but that's not the case. He withdrew, lived in the country, um, made two more albums, both of which are very beautiful. Uh, the, the, the second one, Herges Ridge, I don't think he was that into it. I think he thought it had been... I think he viewed that as an album of barrel scrapings, really. I think he thought he'd kind of uh, done the big one with Chibi the Bells, and I think he struggled with that project. But it's got some beautiful, beautiful writing on it, you know, lovely composition, um, quite mystical. Then he went on to do Omidorn, which again is a wonderful album, I don't think either of those records were ever going to eclipse this one, and obviously in later years Mike would return to this over and over again, you know, Tubular Bells 2, Tubular Bells 3, the orchestral Tubular Bells, I think he realised that it didn't really matter what he did for the rest of his career, this was the album that everybody was going to remember. Um, in the end, he ended up having, um, he ended up having therapy, and... Um, his life did turn around for a while, a bit later on, but he was always uh, he was always dogged by those kind of emotional problems. But uh, it's an extraordinary story. If you haven't seen the documentary, and I'm just giving you loads of spoilers there, but I will link it down below because it's very interesting hearing Mike actually explaining the story himself. Nowadays, he seems to be living, I don't know, maybe in the Caribbean. He's got this fantastic studio. You can see all these palm fronds outside the window just looks fantastic and he seems really well he seems really happy and he's able to look back on his career now um, and get some perspective on it all and uh, it's just great to hear him talking about those times and just what an extraordinary experience it must have been putting that album together and um, you know by, by 1978 Virgin had moved on to doing punk music and they started calling him um, in the British music press they started referring to him as Mike Oldfart and uh, maybe he never did really shake that off really he never really embraced punk rock as such having said that if you listen to Amarok which was a later album we did there's some quite interesting abrasive stuff on that record uh, but yes Mike Olfart I'm not sure if he ever quite shook that off but um, anyway there we go so I thought I would come on and do a bit of a tribute to Mike Oldfield and Tribute of Bells because it is an album which is immensely important to me and like I said it was inspired by Jeff's video so I'll link that down below Calico Silver great video uh, on his lifelong musical love affair with Tubular Bells and Michael Field. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.